Throughout history, people who have been pronounced dead, but then later successfully resuscitated, have recounted eerily similar stories. Upon the moment of bodily death, they report that their consciousness, their awareness, their feelings, memories, and personal identity all remain intact but become detached from their physical body. They can still see and hear everything around them, but no longer through their eyes and ears. Their consciousness rises out of their dying bodies, and they observe the resuscitation attempt, or their mourning family members, while floating around in this disembodied state. Soon they begin to hear a ringing, buzzing, or musical vibrations, and find themselves traveling through a darkness, or a tunnel, toward a white light in the distance. The light lovingly beckons them with its beauty and brings them to a heavenly realm where they meet with deceased friends, family, and angelic beings of light. These light beings emanate love and compassion and telepathically present themselves as afterlife guides tasked with helping recently deceased souls transition. They then initiate a full life review where people report their entire life flashing before them. In an instant, they are shown a panoramic playback of their whole lives on earth. The beings of light observe the life review alongside the recently deceased, drawing their attention to certain key moments when they made selfish, insensitive, or immoral decisions and question them about their behavior. The near-death experiencer usually feels remorseful and regretful about their shortcomings in life, and the light beings console them by letting them know they can go back and that they still have a mission on earth to complete. This beautiful heavenly realm, the loving light beings, and warm reception by deceased friends and family makes most want nothing more than to stay, and many often protest, insisting not to return. Ultimately, however, they are coaxed, coerced, and convinced to come back to earth and soon find themselves waking up alive in their physical bodies. This exact sequence of events, or a version thereof, has been experienced by countless people throughout history. In recent times, many well-respected clinicians like Dr. Raymond Moody, Dr. Kenneth Ring, Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, Dr. Michael Sabom, and Dr. Melvin Morse have left their established professional careers in order to dedicate their lives to researching and reporting on this fascinating phenomenon. These and other doctors have recorded and detailed several thousand cases in dozens of books compiling an incredibly compelling preponderance of evidence. These modern near-death experiences also mirror many facets of the ancient Egyptian and Tibetan books of the dead, such as the existence of a bardo body that survives physical death, meetings with luminous beings and deceased relatives, and an intensive life-review judgment scene. Researcher Dr. Jeffrey Long has compiled the website nderf.org, with over 4,000 testimonies from modern-day near-death experiencers who share very similar stories. When compared for commonalities and contrasted for inconsistencies, a disturbing common thread that crops up repeatedly is deception and manipulation by the light and light beings. For example, nearly 95% of near-death experiencers insinuate that they are pulled or drawn to the light in an irresistible manner, like by magnet as though they have little choice in the matter. The Life Review Judgment Scene features God or another authoritarian luminous being who points out specific instances of regrettable, inconsiderate, or shameful behavior engaged in during their lifetimes, then uses those negative events and emotions to convince the recently deceased to return to Earth. Most are manipulated to believe they have some ambiguous mission to complete and willingly return after the Life Review. But many others are not so easily deceived, and when they refuse to return to Earth, find themselves forcibly sent back to their physical bodies against their will. In her NDE testimony, Mary S. said, In the distance I saw a light, and I went into it. The light was very intensely bright, but not blinding. I could hear sublime music that sounded like love songs. I knew at that moment that I am not alone in the world. I felt an unconditional and infinite love. I had never felt so bathed in love, and I had never felt anything like that since. Maria T. said, I was thrown straight into the middle of the warmest, most beautiful, most welcoming light, where I instantly felt that here I feel good. 
I was drawn to the ocean of light as a gigantic magnet and drowned in light exactly like the center of the sun. And Martin M. said, Then all of a sudden I was gone from my small house, and I was in a dark space or tunnel. It scared me. I felt lost and didn't know what was happening when I saw a white light in the distance. The light was whiter than white, a light we don't have here on earth. I felt I had to go to the light, but I didn't know how. I was sucked towards it, and once in the light, I saw that the colors were much more intense than here. When describing the light, near-death experiencers universally report feelings of love, happiness, and contentment so intense they are fully enthralled and entranced by it. Bonnie V. said, It was the most incredibly beautiful light that I had ever seen. It seemed to have a personality that was beyond belief loving. I was happy just being in the light. Larry L. recounted his experience, saying, When I got to the light, it was like all of a sudden there was nothing but the most intense bright white all around me. I instantly realized the most peaceful, pain-free, contented, euphoric state that I can imagine. I never felt so good and at home in all my life experiences on earth. And Bill V. said, As I moved forward in the dark tunnel, I passed into a bright white light. It was the most incredibly beautiful, peaceful, calm, loving place I had ever been in my life. It was full of this unconditional love and this great knowledge of the universe. As wonderful as these accounts seem on the surface, such stories of this hypnotic loving light that greets us at death also raises many questions. If the possibility exists for us to experience absolute bliss, contentment, and pain-free euphoria, why is that not available here on earth? Why is such beauty, happiness, and unconditional love reserved only for the afterlife? In considering the life review judgment scene that occurs right afterwards, the light's strategy seems reminiscent of the narcissistic manipulation tactic called love bombing, whereby a target is initially overwhelmed with flattery and attention to butter them up and relax their defenses. Afterwards, the love and positivity are promptly taken away, leaving the target feeling devalued, discarded, and while in that emotionally vulnerable space, easily deceived. This is conveniently when God, Jesus, Buddha, Krishna, angels, light beings, or deceased relatives appear to help guide the soul with their transition. These beings always seem specially tailored to the individual and can shapeshift depending on what form best suits them. Lonnie F. remembers, I was spoken to immediately and made aware of a presence. After we agreed that I would see him in physical form, he appeared. I think that having me make the decision to communicate with him, instead of him just appearing in front of me, was more for my comfort than anything else. Kathy B. recounts her story, saying, The thoughts came into my head, What kind of form or shape would make you most comfortable? What do you mean? I thought back. Some require me to take the shape of a wise old man, others a woman, and still others an animal, all of different races, ages, sizes, or species. What about you? I thought without hesitation, human. With that, the light began to simultaneously separate into amazing rays of color and intensify into a more solid form. Once the light reached the stage where it looked like a human form, a rather generic-looking cookie-cutter shape, like a gingerbread man, appeared. After assuming some form, the beings telepathically initiate a life review, where they draw attention to key moments during the life of the recently deceased. They ask leading questions, prying into these pivotal moments, poking and prodding about their behavior and how they treated others. These beings seem very focused on pointing out wrongs committed by the recently deceased, and making them feel guilty and ashamed. Gail A. recounted, Then came a judgment of sorts, where I was judged on the things I had done. I wasn't judged on big things, more small instances of intent. It was the little things that mattered, and not the big things. Then I was told that I had to go back, which didn't make me happy at all, as I knew that being alive would hurt. Every aspect of living would hurt. The thought of going back into a wet, disgusting body repulsed me. I couldn't believe I had to wear my body again, 
as it felt like wearing an old disgusting coat that belonged to someone else. George W. stated, I think I am still stuck in the life review part sometimes. I haven't been the best person, and have sinned a good bit. I feel like I'm supposed to realize that I'm my own worst enemy, and need to forgive myself and move on. My grandfather was my judge in the experience, and he told me to come back and honor my father. And Deborah J. said, Next thing I knew, I was standing in front of a council of thirteen beings, with the one in the middle twice as big as the six on either side of him. They were all sitting in big chairs at a sizable distance in front of me. I was naked and felt totally revealed, and tried to use my hands to cover myself up. The main one in the middle began to speak to me telepathically. The questions they were asking me were about my life and how I had lived it. I got the feeling they were not pleased with me. I was terrified, to say the least, exposed to the hilt. I knew they knew it all. Towards the end of the ordeal, he told me they were not going to let me remember most of what had happened, and they had decided they were going to send me back, because you have to get it right. The next thing I knew, I was in my body, on the bed, some three days later. Most near-death experiencers report feeling so blissful in their disembodied state and contented with the heavenly afterlife realm that they do not want to return to earth. Even when the light beings protest how much their families will miss them, insisting that their time has not yet come, and that they still have a mission to complete in life, the majority of near-death experiencers wish nothing more than to stay in the afterlife realm. Even after pleading and begging not to be sent back, many report being coerced or outright forced back into their bodies against their will. Joanne M. remembers, I encountered a form who I knew was God, who told me it was time to now go back. I started arguing with God in my own little obnoxious way, and God said I needed to go back because my mission here wasn't complete. Mary W. said, My main reason for staying was because I didn't want to let God down. I wanted to finish the job I had come here to do. I wanted to show him that I'm not a quitter. I also wanted to live on this earth knowing God loved me. I felt like I had no other choice than to stay. I replied, almost in a whisper, and very, very reluctantly, I really want to go with you, but I have to stay. Leonard K. stated, At some point, God told me, you must go back to earth. I refused. No way I should go back into that sick body. Then God showed me a vision of my mother who cried because I was dead. Then I came back. And Steve L. said, I asked if I could stay because it was so beautiful there and I didn't want to come back to earth. The light being said, No, you have a mission that you must do. I didn't know what the mission was, but I said yes to returning back to earth. In the majority of cases, the near-death experiencer is subtly coerced through suggestions and visions to willingly return to earth. After shape-shifting into a personalized authority figure and insisting they have some ambiguous mission to complete here on earth, the light usually succeeds in manipulating them to agree. In some cases, however, particularly stubborn souls who refuse to capitulate are simply forced back into their bodies without their consent. Geraldine B. remembers, It was not my choice. I was forced to go back. I didn't want to. The decision was made by that main light source. Philip S. said, There was a royal figure who decided, without my consent, if I could stay with them or not it was decided I must return back to Earth, where I currently and happily reside, but I wish I could have had the choice to stay there. Stephen R. stated, They asked me if I wanted to stay with them, or if I wanted to come back to Earth. Because everything was so overwhelmingly wonderful and beautiful, I asked to stay with them. It wasn't until years later, after I realized what happened to me had a name, near-death experience, and that what happened to me was real, not a dream, that I remembered then, they sent me back against my will. Then I was really mad. Why did they make me come back when I wanted to stay? I felt controlled. Why did they ask me if the decision wasn't really mine? I was so mad. And Maria T. said, Then I thought like this. It's not so bad here. I don't want to go back to Earth. No. Never again back there. Never again back to Earth. 
And why should I go back down to earth, where everything is so materialistic, where you have to fight hard for results, a lot of work for nothing? Here I could move as I wanted, where I wanted. It's not so bad here. I absolutely don't want to go back down to earth. And while I was enjoying my new condition of total freedom and total love, I was pulled down, as by a line, an elevator, or a force. Something pulled me back into my body. It's quite suspicious how this after-death light either coerces or sucks people towards it, transforms itself into a personalized authority figure, replays negative moments from their lives to guilt-trip and shame them, then coerces or forces them to return back to Earth. Why is there so much manipulation involved in this experience? If souls can simply be forced back without their consent, why is so much effort put into persuading them to return willingly? The afterlife realm seems so abundantly superior to Earth that few souls wish to return, which begs the question, why would anyone freely choose to come here in the first place? Is there so much deception, manipulation, and coercion in the afterlife realm because it's necessary to trick souls into coming here? Leslie V. said of the heavenly afterlife realm, It felt very warm, safe, cozy, and comfortable. I did many recreational drinks in my youth, and this was the best high you can imagine. The high of all highs, the ecstasy of all ecstasy, the ultimate high, just so free, light, and weightless. Accounts like Leslie's spark serious questions about the nature of our reality. If there exists a realm of pure bliss and ecstasy just outside of these physical bodies, why have our souls chosen to don them? If heaven is so freely accessible, what exactly are we doing down here on earth? Duane S. said of his NDE, After experiencing heaven, in no way did I want to go back to earth any time soon. If earth was a theme park, then they could have any part of my unused ticket they wanted. I had had enough drama for a while. I was finished with that petty, trite, hellhole of an earth game it had all become. Howdy Mikowski wrote, Generally, when a person has had an NDE, they present a similar story. They enter a realm that is confusing, until they either see a white light, often a tunnel, with perhaps angel-like beings or dead relatives encouraging them towards the light. Those who experience this light say it is the most beautiful experience they could imagine. Love personified, some report. A place they did not want to leave. At some point, they are told, either after a type of life review or by simple presentation, that it is not their time. They have work or a mission to complete, or they have more to learn, and are sent back to their bodies on earth. The experience tends to transform them, and often they change their life in drastic ways. Generally, they tend to become kinder, more loving, and lose their fear of death. It all sounds good, doesn't it? Or is it too good to be true? If I were to ask the average person what an NDE is like, they would present the words white light, tunnel, love, peace, God, life review, and relatives. This is what makes it into TV shows and movies. The white light is your friend. It will comfort you and take away all your pain. What if the white light is not the doorway to heaven, but a slide back into this realm of suffering? Then much of what is presented in these experiences may be deception. Another red flag, even in these standard feel-good experiences, is that most of the people are sent back against their will. Generally, they all want to stay in the love and peace they feel, but a being that they feel they should agree with tells them they have to go back, or just forces them back. Generally, they are told they have more to learn, or a mission to complete. Yet many also claim that while in this after-death realm, they had access to all-knowing. And so, what more does a soul need to learn if they already are in a place where they know everything? Oddly, this part of the experience tends to get glossed over. As the returned person focuses on the love and happiness of it all, they forget that they came back to Earth against their will.